So welcome to the last session of the conference, last before closing, so please don't leave immediately afterwards. We still have awards and announcements and other attractions. Um, so this uh, plenary session is devoted to the topic of uh, future electronic governance. Um, uh, why we chose to uh, uh, focus on the future for electronic governance. We have seen that in the short history of electronic government, the orientation or the focus of electronic governance practice and research has changed. Uh, and ISGOV conference series uh, run since 2007 also witnessed this change through the type of submissions that we received through the type of sessions that were created out of such submissions and the comments and discussions that were uh, uh, taking place during the conference. So we have seen this shift taking place from technological and technical concerns, how to connect, uh, how to build government portals, how to uh, connect uh, uh, government information and services to internet, how to uh, open electronic channels of access for citizens. Um, we've seen it shifting to organizational issues and transformational uh, concern with how to uh, transform the, the working to optimize, automate uh, administrative processes, uh, how to connect agencies together, how to build one-stop government portals and have whole of government arrangements. And, uh, and more recently, we do expect that government investment into ICT is really producing public value, that it contributes to policy objectives, that it's a major tool for the pursuit of development goals. And uh, very recently, we also seek support from ICT to achieve a certain balance between conflicting development objectives like for us to seek the objectives of economic, social or environmental sustainability. So this uh, change is more surprising because of the scale and because it happened in uh, uh, barely uh, 10 years, just over a, a decade. So, of course, the natural question here is what's next? So what is the next for electronic governance? What is the future of electronic governance? So in order to address this question, we invited uh, a distinguished keynote speaker and a panel of distinguished uh, experts and practitioners to share their vision of future of electronic governance. We might invite them a year from now to, to, to check how their futures have unfolded, and if not, then, then why? Then ask why. So it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome our keynote speaker. Uh, Alexander Treschel is a professor of political science uh, in the European uh, University Institute in Florence in Italy. He is the first full-time Swiss chair in federalism and democracy at the university. Uh, Alexander is also an, an initiator and co-director of the EU Observatory, EU, EU Democracy Observatory. Uh, his research interests include uh, democratic institutions, um, politics and internet, and European integration. So today he's going to tell us about new media, the impact of new media on democratic processes, particularly on citizen-government uh, relationships. Okay? So please join me in welcoming Alexander. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much, Thomas. Um, well, this uh, conference um, offered an outstanding état des lieux of uh, electronic governance, and we heard most interesting contributions throughout these three days on sustainable development, on cloud computing, open government, on interoperability, smart cities, on online politics and management, on the control of corruption in the internet age, on pervasive broadband, service delivery, and so on. What these contributions had in common was a focus on transparency and efficiency in the exchanges between citizens, private companies, and the public sector. Of course, technology's first and possibly major defining 
function is to provide tools for solving problems. And in terms of governance, the increasingly complex, fast-paced, often obscure and all-encompassing decision-making processes pose problems which ICTs can help resolve. And we heard a lot about the prospects of these innovations which are basically designed to make governance more seamless, efficient, cost-effective and transparent, ultimately bringing governance closer to collectivities, firms and their citizens. Let me today, at the end of this conference, uh, take one step back. I will also try at the same time to you know, take two steps ahead. The step back is a reminder of what ultimately governance, and hence e-governance, is all about. And I'm speaking of democracy. There is no democracy without government, and therefore without governance. Even in the most direct form of collective uh, decision-making processes, even in the most pure, in the purest direct democracy, some kind of management, steering and controlling of public affairs uh, has to take place. Uh, and it's usually performed by a body that is smaller than this collectivity. For sure, the inverse is not true. Uh, too many autocratic, despotic and authoritarian regimes can do without a pinch of democracy. But these are not the regimes we are primarily interested in during this, uh, this conference. Mind you, they are not that immune to developments in the field of ICTs, and in their specific case, ICTs can help bring about their downfall. Of course, Egypt um, and Tunisia come to mind, and others may follow in this logic. We could follow, uh, by the way, a fascinating uh, keynote and panel on this issue this morning. So when I was asked to speak today about the future of e-governance, I thought I should not only address the efficiency-focused debate uh, on electronic processes in governance, but on the legitimacy-focused uh, one on electronic democracy. To do so, my step back will uh, be a brief assessment of the state democracy is in today. I will argue that uh, democratic governance is currently not going very strong. And the first step forward that I will take, um, or try to take, is to imagine what this digital revolution might do to democratic governance uh, of the future. The second step will be the impossible assessment of something that does not yet exist, uh, precisely because it belongs to the future. But what I will offer is a reflection on the possible effects of the projected developments on the relationship between actors, and most prominently between citizens and the state, speculating about us entering soon in what I would call the participatory turn in governance. So let me thus first say a few words about the state of current governance. Modern liberal democratic government around the world is predominantly shaped by reference to the idea of representation. In short, this means that a few are democratically chosen to safeguard the interests and the needs of the many. Members of parliament, ministers in government, judges and high-level civil servants are elected or appointed through various forms of selection mechanisms. And during their office, they represent voters, non-voters, parties, their own very institutions, the law, their local, regional or national authority, and vis-à-vis -vis the, exter the exterior, their country. Together, the members of these instances of representation form the political parliamentary, administrative, and judicial elites dominating the world of representative democracy. Now, for many citizens, to paraphrase um, the Austrian economist, Josef uh, Schumpeter, for many, citizens should only be called upon every four or five or six years. 
simply to elect or select this elite capable of taking care of things on its own. And the system is supposed to work just fine, and arguably it actually did work just fine for a long time, at least until systems in which elites simply represented other uh, elites started to open up. Um, former non-citizens became enfranchised, I'm speaking of ordinary men and women, the young, migrants, etc., and could organize in movements and parties representing their own interests. Today, however, this seemingly well-functioning uh, system of representation uh, is under serious stress. Seven years ago, the Council of Europe gave Professor Philippe Schmitter from the EUI and myself the opportunity to bring together a group of scholars in Europe to assess um, the state of democracy predominantly in Europe. We mainly identified two major challenges to current governance, in particular to European democracy. Uh, first, we identified a growing pressure from above uh, at the macro level, created by processes of globalization and in Europe by European integration. And these challenges did not vanish in these seven years. To the contrary, they have actually uh, constrained democracy um, um, ever more with um, more representatives deciding about less. Secondly, we identified uh, challenges developing within society at the micro level among citizens and the organizations trying to represent uh, the latter. I'm speaking of intercultural migration. I'm thinking of changing demographics, um, a sense of insecurity, growing discontent among citizens and distrust uh, in the institutions leading ultimately to protest. Let me pay uh, a short tribute to my uh, colleague and very close friend, Professor Peter Mayer, one of the greatest men and most inspiring intellectuals I ever came across. Peter sadly and unexpectedly passed away this summer, way too early, at the age of 60. But in the fall of last year, he diagnosed democratic government, particularly in Europe, as being caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, national governments and legislatures are less and less able to autonomously decide about the fate of their country. Instead, they must follow mandates from above, given by, to them by the IMF, the ECJ, the ECHR, the European Commission, and so on. For Peter Mayer, this is the rock. The hard place is a distrusting, critical, and increasingly emancipated electorate with its own demands and mandates for the polity. Representative democracy, therefore, gradually loses the degree of leeway it once enjoyed. In hard times and under the weight of the economic uh, crisis we're going through, these rocks and hard places, I would say, did not become any softer. Uh, there are two supplementary challenges which I would like to highlight here and that we arguably failed to sufficiently assess seven years uh, ago. In our defense, we could argue, well, these challenges did not exist back then and therefore we could not actually detect them. But that's not entirely true. We actually did detect them. But what we failed, um, we failed in assessing or imagining what they can do in a combined way. And I refer to the immense change in modern digital technology-induced communication and the innovations brought upon by participatory forms of decision-making. So let me take this first step ahead and reflect on what ICTs might do to democratic governance. With the advent and dizzying uh, diffusion of the internet, the control of representative institutions over society has gradually crumbled. Let me offer an example. Take the arguably most intensive moment in democratic life, elections. Back in 2004, I imagined, uh, in the context of this project for the Council of Europe, 
and a bit for fun, an election in 2020, where the campaign and the vote would take place on an electronic internet platform. What I imagined sounded very futuristic at the time, and I must say, today it almost sounds dated. But let's have a very brief look at these imaginary elections of 2020. Now, in that country where this election would take place, uh, the internet has become an omnipresent feature of daily life, Wi-Fi, broadband, everywhere for free, and citizens use it on a permanent basic basis. The virtual election platform, as I call it, the VEP, uh, was offered by the government and uh, contains four modules. The smart vote module, as I call it back then, the MP monitoring module, the multimedia blog module, and the internet voting module. Now, let me take you very briefly through these four modules. The smart vote module is a module where you, as a user, you can go on to a list of questions uh, or statements um, coming from various fields of public policy and that you answer and you basically give the system your preferences, your political preferences. The system then matches these preferences with the preferences of political parties or candidates running in these elections and it basically produces a list uh, or another form of graphical representation of your overlap between your preferences and the preferences uh, that are at offer. Now, in my imaginary country, the electoral system allowed for complete open list, an op open list and free list system, where you could actually uh, use uh, 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 an empty list and fill it with candidates coming from different uh, parties. The MP monitor module, um, as I labeled it, automatically registers for the past legislature in this system all the roll call votes that MPs are taking in the hemicycle. And uh, therefore, it builds some kind of objective profile of what incumbents have been doing over the past legislature. And then the multimedia uh, uh, block module uh, in this uh, virtual elect uh, election platform offers the citizens the opportunity to interact with each other, to debate, to upload videos and pictures and, and arguments uh, on, on the platform. And finally, the internet voting module, pretty straightforwardly, offers then this user of that platform to cast the vote via the internet. Now, you can imagine the immediate effects of such a platform. For sure, citizens would get better informed about the political offer. Uh, for sure, they would be able to cast their vote in a more convenient way. And for sure, this would make elections generally more attractive to voters, as they would be able to customize their ballot to their own preferences. Now, when I presented uh, this idea, uh, seven years ago at the Conference of Presidents of Parliament in Europe, um, I was immediately attacked by the Deputy Speaker of the UK House of Commons, who went up to the rostrum and said, this is uh, terrible, uh, uh, a crazy vision, uh, and I should be more or less arrested for advertising such a system uh, in which politicians would become mere marionettes or puppets of daily changing public opinion. Now, he was of course wrong, uh, in the sense that I was not advertising such a system. I simply imagined it, but the more I think about it, the more I believe he was actually quite right uh, when it comes to the major effects that such a system could have. So let me tell you why, but only after an intriguing observation. Today, and even back then, seven years ago, all the elements I mentioned of this futuristic platform existed already. They even uh, 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 proliferated quite strongly on their own across uh, uh, lots of polities. Smart vote, voting uh, techniques, voting advice applications as we call them also, um, exist in many countries in Europe uh, and elsewhere. In the Netherlands, in Switzerland, in Finland, in Germany, 
And in other places, they have become an integral part of the entire electoral process. As a voter, you don't even imagine having an election anymore where you cannot go onto a website and check for how close or far you are from the partisan offer. Um, and they are extremely popular in Switzerland in the upcoming federal elections. Um, I believe um, one-third to probably half of the voters will actually have used what it's called in Switzerland, the smart vote um, system. And that's a huge figure. Voting advice applications have become standard. At the EUI we have, uh, in Florence, we have developed the largest and the, the most, uh, the widest used um, uh, system of that sort uh, in Europe. It was called the European, the EU profiler uh, that ran in the context of the last parliamentary elections, European parliamentary elections of June 2009, which attracted in 30 countries and 24 languages over two and a half million users. Now, the MP monitoring has by now become extremely sophisticated, also a little bit everywhere. MPs, every single word, every vote is recorded, not just in the plenaries, but even in the commissions. Immediately put online and coded along a multitude of dimensions. Of course, uh, just as you can follow your team on sports platforms, you can now also follow your MP or your party in parliament, in government and elsewhere. The multimedia blogs, I don't have to say much, they are omnipresent. And with regards to internet voting, a, a very enthusiastic start in quite a number of countries was followed by some more uh, of a sobering uh, period during which um, many uh, countries who initially wanted to go ahead with that abandoned this idea and uh, uh, had problems with implementing internet voting. By now, there's a second spring, I would argue, uh, for internet voting. It it uh, becomes uh, 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 more and more popular again. And finally, um, what is important here to say is that what does not exist is the proper platform where all these elements come together. Uh, so the effects of the individual elements remain for the moment rather limited. And we have certainly not yet arrived at the very negative prophecy of the Deputy Speaker of the UK House of Commons. But in fact, internet voting does attract more and more voters, but its effects on participation remain still quite uh, uh, small for the time being. Also, first studies appear uh, on the effects of voting ap uh, advice applications on participation, on partisan preferences, and on vote choice. And there again, some effects are there, but they're still uh, at least not uh, very, very big. Uh, and the same goes for MP monitoring systems, etc. But imagine these elements proposed in a seamless way. I strongly believe that this will happen. There is no way one could be forever able to separate information provision and information gathering and processing by uh, uh, the voters. The act of voting and the monitoring of those who got elected. And when all of this gets together, we have a problem. And let me tell you why. Take a future voter who has at her disposal this web. The voter will fill out the voting advice application, select the best fitting candidates, vote for them online, and, um, and basically uh, uh, get a list back after the, after the election, telling them which of these candidates have been elected and the others uh, it uh, can be discarded from this list. He has then the possibility to click on a, on a link, say follow this uh, MP or follow my party, um, a bit like in Facebook, the I like, and then uh, the ballot will uh, um, basically from this, from this moment on, the system will automatically follow these MPs and report back to this user of that platform what's going on in Parliament, what this uh, uh, elected representative has been doing in, uh, in Parliament. And the system will be intelligent because it will check the behavior of this Member of Parliament and compare it to the promises that this Member of Parliament has made to this voter. Um, so, 
You could imagine some kind of you know, minimal overlap between uh, what I, uh, as the voter, would expect this uh, MP to do and what I give him as a liberty. So let's say a congruent score of 80%. Now, as soon as, as this MP does not represent my opinion anymore, by more than 20%, I'd get some kind of alert on my phone or my whatever uh, system. Uh, telling me that basically this MP ceases to represent me. And this is uh, a little bit like a yellow card um, that will be given to this, uh, to this MP um, by the system that I then as a voter can turn into a red one at the next elections and send him off the pitch. Now, this would be something like a personalized Obama meter, uh, which exists. Uh, uh, where a permanent electoral battle would take place between satisfiers, satisfiers sorry, and the emancipated MPs, honoring or not these virtual contracts that we would have been set up, in a sense, between the voters and the MPs. Now, such virtual representatives they exist already, uh, for example, in Sweden, uh, at the local level, where some elected representatives are simply implementing in Parliament whatever their electorate tells them uh, to implement, like a little bit like robots. But in these cases, though re-election can become more or less assured, I would argue that representative democracy, as we know it, seeks to exist. Today, citizens can individually and collectively track the physical movements and the oral declarations of their representatives almost wherever they are wherever they go. Hiding from the public's view is not possible anymore, or even attempts to control the media, for instance, become obsolete with grassroots citizen online journalism circumventing censorship with ease. Even a few years ago, mainstream traditional media, such as TV channels and uh, radio stations and the print media, were dictating what was news and what was not news. The rather static, often top-down, uh, rigid, not very interactive websites of the Web 1.0 uh, generation were reproducing, discussing and commenting the news produced by the media once they hit the public. Now this is, I think, quite radically changing. Uh, what can be observed today already, and not only in the US, might well become a reality on a more general scale. It's the fact that news is increasingly produced on the internet, with the traditional media actors lagging behind. In fact, there are now TV web, show, uh, web shows and columns and newspapers of what's going on in the internet, um, in the traditional media. More and more often do we hear as sources of some news a HTTP address or, more recently, uh, tweets coming in through Twitters who effectively break the news. And no media outlet can ignore uh, the content, say, of Twitter today. Worse, an ever-growing part of the audience turns to sites such as YouTube or Twitter for their preferred channel of um, information stemming from so-called citizen videos, tweets, and blogs. So I'm not predicting any breakdown of uh, traditional media, but the challenge of a potential inversion of the flow of information, and therefore of market share and of power, is clearly out there. Now these developments are on their way. And in many cases, it is true that the internet may bring representatives closer to the citizens, with their existence and activities being only a mouse click away uh, for anybody interested. It's also true that modern information and communication technologies can foster participation of citizens in representative democracies, for example, through internet voting. However, the apparent proximity of electorates, of the electorate to their representatives, is often reduced to trivia, scandals, shows, and entertainment. 
paradoxically, as public scrutiny deepens, the distance between the rulers and the ruled regarding substantive politics stretches further. Um, political theorist Bernard Manin, in his audience democracy, was foreseeing uh, a state where politics were made on the stage by politicians for a passive audience. And this audience democracy, I believe, is becoming something I would call the paparazzi democracy, where citizens become actors themselves, controlling and inter interacting with their representatives. In a sense, their mobile phones, equipped with cameras and internet access, their social networks and digital skills, allowed them to climb the stage of politics. In this sense, the participatory logic of Web 2.0 and its possibilities contain the potential to profoundly transform representative democracy. And this brings me to the second challenge and step for representative democracy that we might have underestimated seven years ago. And it's the growing number of direct and participatory democratic mechanisms in governance. I foresee governance to become ever more participatory, something one could call I think, the participatory turn in governance, and hence in e-governance. A few decades ago, direct democratic institutions, such as the referendum or the popular initiatives, occasionally complemented existing forms and sets of political institutions. Today, direct democracy can be found in most polities around the globe, at all levels of government, from the local to the supranational. Governance has gone participatory. Purely new forms of participatory mechanisms have emerged, starting off as experiments, such as, for example, the participatory budgeting process, which first saw the light of day in Brazil, have now gradually sedated on the institutional soil of, for example, European polities. In particular, policy-making processes opened up to citizens and civil society organizations through deliberative forums, citizen juries, participatory budgeting, citizen consultations, online collective drafting, collective drafting of constitutions, like in Iceland, as we heard yesterday. Once implemented, these institutions tend to become stable elements of democratic life. And in most cases, however, they also weaken representative governance. They introduce a continuous involvement of citizens in politics. The times where citizens chose their representatives in an election and had to wait for the next election to again have a say, I think, are over. Citizens and civil society have become permanent actors. And the biggest losers of this development are, of course, political parties and their elected representatives, once the most important players uh, in the democratic realm. Now, let me go a step further. Remember the voting advice application I mentioned? Well, their basic logic is to match citizens' demands with the political offer that is out there, given by parties and their Candidates. Now, these uh, VAAs will be perfectly able, in a sense, also not only to match your, as a user, your preferences with the preferences of the candidates and the parties, but actually, you could also match your own preferences with the preferences of everybody else. And this has not been done so far. So for scientific purposes, that doesn't exist. For, for scientific purposes, we're trying to build something like that. We're working on that. If anybody out there here is here who wants to help finance that, come and see me after that talk. But let's get back to the future again. Imagine now that in the next European parliamentary elections of 2014, uh, say 10 million users uh, will use such a you know, profiler. Now, that's an absolutely plausible figure. As I mentioned before, we had two and a half million on our system in 2009. 
Now imagine this user being able to click a button and say, give me the one million users among these 10 million who match best with me, with my preferences. Or imagine this user telling the system, give me all those who have been using the system who have the exact same preference than I have on all of these matters. Okay? Now, this is technologically perfectly possible. But imagine something else that's technologically possible. Imagine this person then being able to connect to these matches uh, through social networks, for example. Okay? A Facebook group, for example. What you have is basically the creation of a virtual party, of your party. Okay? That is much better matching your preferences than any of the established parties that are running in these elections. So, potentially, it's basically a party made up by people that are exactly like you. You want to get one million signatures for the European Citizens Initiative, a new instrument that was uh, uh, offered to European citizens by the Lisbon Treaty. No problem. The ECI, European Citizens Initiative, allows you to, or will allow you, once it's implemented fully, to collect signatures digitally. So basically, you're one click away from your own European Citizens Initiative. But this amazing empowerment of citizens, thanks to the combination of participatory governance and these developments in the realm of ICTs, comes at a price. When pushed too far, the process of opening up to participatory democracy, I would argue, can harm democracy to court. The long term is gradually replaced by the short term, and legislating is exposed to a good deal of uncertainty, as an active citizenry can continuously change politics. At the same time, popular demands arise which may openly violate some basic principles and values upon which modern uh, democratic societies uh, are based. The recent popular vote in Switzerland prohibiting uh, any new construction of minarets, or in that same country, the launch of a popular initiative in the summer of 2010, last year, asking for the reintroduction of the death penalty, clearly shows the limits of direct democracy. Discrimination and human rights violations cannot be excluded from the set of outcomes of these participatory processes. So the combination of the two challenges, modern information and communication technologies on the one hand, and participatory democracy on the other, can lead to a weakening of some fundamental institutions of representative democracy, such as parliaments, and political parties. Online forms of democratic innovations, such as online petitions or initiatives, grassroots controlled tools, such as online voting advice applications, allow citizens to learn more about their demands and the available offer. If not satisfied, these innovations give them the opportunity to act, and this independently from the traditional elites. In this sense, these challenges also offer opportunities, of course, particularly when they are bundled. The Internet allows a larger proportion of the citizenry to take part in the democratic life of modern liberal policies. It is also uh, true that it allows people to debate and connect across great distances and across borders. Participatory institutions and practices become more widely diffused thanks to internet technology. However, I would argue that clear limits have to be found and set to the proliferation of non-democratic demands funneled through such democratic processes. The scourge of discrimination and human rights violations needs to be fought with every available mean in order to preserve the values and principles upon which democracy, including representative democracy, is built. Now, the really scary thing is that nobody can really do anything against these developments. Students with a functioning server and a little bit of programming skills can produce highly popular voting advice applications, 
for instance. But who can prevent them from doing this? Who can prevent a civil society organization to produce an online monitoring system of members of parliaments? And why should anybody prevent them from doing so in the first place? The jury is out there. But what I would like you to take home today is a brief reflection on the positive sides of these developments, which undeniably are there, while not forgetting that their combined impact on democracy might not be the initially desired one. So let me conclude. Representatives can no longer act like Josef Schumpeter once suggested and take care of things between elections. This is so because on the one hand, they, the representatives, are no longer left alone. On the contrary, their acts are scrutinized and their behavior is monitored on a permanent basis. On the other hand, they, the representatives, are no longer on their own. Instead, ordinary citizens have started taking their place on the stage and have begun to take decisions and propose new issues to be put on a common agenda in between elections. Both scrutiny and co-decision are enhanced by modern information and communication technologies. Therefore, representative democracy, the way we know it today, is in dire straits. But whether democracy in general is also in dire straits is probably more open to question. Thank you for your attention. Some questions. Yes, you can start ah, here. For questions, yes. We have uh, time for a couple of questions uh, before we commence the panel discussion. Can you please raise your hand? Any questions? Yes, please. You will need a microphone, yes. Well, uh, just one very short comment. I think information communication technology, innovation in it, has much more than what you advanced in your lecture. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my, my point was not to be exhaustive, obviously, but raise a finger when it comes to democracy. That's all. I'm sorry, this is a technical point. From a technical no problem. Point. Okay, any more comments and questions? Yes, please. Can I Hi. have a microphone, please? Yes. <laughs> so the question, the question is, uh, is simple. You, you described all the kind of smart vote and voting advice applications. What uh, would be the kind of most uh, kind of likely candidates uh, that would pro uh, would produce uh, such results as you described? Do you know now? Well, they are produced on a daily basis. They already exist, these systems. Uh, they're just not combined. So far, the state has one monopole over one of these aspects, and that's voting. Okay, you cannot create an online voting system and cast a valid ballot if you're a university student or a civil society organization. This is still the state controlling that. Um, but soon, the state will have to give in and will have to allow the combination of, say, casting a vote and having people uh, more easily access the information and the campaign that precedes that vote. I, I mean, this is the future, and it's always difficult to predict the future. Um, or as Einstein once said, uh, I'm not thinking about the future because it's coming very soon. Um, but I, I, th I, 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 I believe firmly that we're heading in this direction. Okay, please. Well, personally, I have no doubt that technologically we will get there. I mean, mesh up technology that exists now makes it possible to collect uh, different applications in a, sim simple, uh, in a single space. So uh, it's really not a question of whether, but when. However, when we look at the use of social media, and the number of people actually participating there actively. 
uh, then there are many more people who just follow and read and less people who actually actively participate. On the other hand, we are all overwhelmed with the influx of information and it becomes more and more complex and uh, really, really hard to uh, evaluate the information. So uh, there are currently uh, discussions about whether there should be regulation on internet search engines because the criteria that are obviously proprietary may influence what's being offered to us. And the same thing might apply to the voting advice system. What are the criteria for selecting information? And uh, shall we be just under the influence on different power players? So in the end, uh, I have a feeling that maybe there will be a shift in power, but even though these systems allow for full participation, I fear that it might not be actually taking place because again, there will be a small per per percentage of population actually taking advantage of the, what is offered. And to be very honest, uh, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. It's difficult to evaluate future political behavior by looking at the political non-behavior of people who do not yet have the tools to actually, who have not been yet empowered to take action. So if you, if you look at uh, social media and you look at, uh, at social networks and political activities on social networks, yes, you're true. They're much, much more lurking and reading than action actually taken. But again, if you, if you add the tools to actually take action and to, to participate effectively through something that cannot be ignored by the elites, a popular initiative, um, then, you know, uh, people may start actually acting the way they, they, they would do. No, merci, Alex. Uh, well, one question, a uh, more matter, a provocation. The smart vote project, the smart vote uh, virtual platform, taken a step further, I mean, would allow even uh, to avoid the problem of uh, voting. So you have your uh, profile uh, uh, online, you choose, uh, or someone choose for you the government, kind of alleviate and uh, government can choose for you and uh, decide what is better for you. But what about ideologies? And politics is much more than just voting. Um, yes, 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 uh, you can think of taking this further, of course. Ideology, I would not build uh, my expectations about uh, great democracy of the future on either existing or uh, upcoming ideologies. Ideologies are rather on the, you know, uh, going down, basically. And for some of them, I'm very happy that they do so. Um, but replacing the vote itself, uh, yeah, it could be absolutely one of the, of the consequences. If you abolish the parties, if you abolish the proper power of representatives, if you abolish their institutions, well, then you don't need to have the selection mechanisms anymore for them. I don't think that we will go that far, but at least uh, it's worthwhile thinking about it. Okay, thank you very much for all the questions. Please hold on your questions for the, for the rest of the panel. Uh, I'd like to uh, request uh, Alexander to thank you. Uh, take a seat at the podium and also welcome our distinguished uh, panel, um, Professor Wojciech Celery. Um, a computer scientist, head of the Department of Information Technology at Poznan University of Economics and the chairman of the National Informatization Council of the Republic of Poland. Um, Dr. Sharon Doss, a senior fellow at the Center for Technology in Government, CTG, and Professor Emerita of Public Administration and Policy and Informatics at the University at Albany State University of New York. Dr. Christine Leitner, uh, head of the Center for European Public Administration at Danube University Krems and uh, recent uh, program manager for the European e-government awards. And Mr. Oleg Petrov, a champion of ICT for development, ICT for D uh, in the World Bank, uh, a, a team mem leader of, for Moldova governance e-transformation project and program coordinator for 
knowledge sharing and learning activities of the ICT department. Please join me in welcoming our panel. So I would like to uh, request our panelists now to um, take a round in a brief statement concerning their vision for the future of electronic governance. Uh, Christine, would you like to start, please? Thank you, Thomas, and thank you, um, Alexander, for this um, very inspiring um, introductory speech. Uh, Thomas, when you asked me to join the panel for this um, um, future of um, e-governance, if you will. I was wondering, in two minutes, how much can I say? I have so many ideas about it and so many things to be said. So what should I focus on? And talking about the future, it would be good now to have a crystal ball, you know, and maybe, um, maybe the way I look at it, not being a digital native, it is like the story that you might have heard about the little boy asking his dad, how did you connect to the internet before you had a computer or a mobile phone. So I might get it totally wrong. But being a civil servant and having worked um, with public administrations for many years at the European level, at the national level, local level, and also you know, being involved in education, I have a few um, remarks uh, to the discussions we've heard um, in, this, uh, in this conference. Um, one of the issues that I'm um, a little bit worried about is the Wild West scenario that was depicted in the beginning of the conference by the President of Estonia. And I'm wondering where we are heading in this respect. Are we heading to a more transparent government or a more transparent citizen? And how are we going to balance issues about privacy and security. My feeling is, and particularly looking at the European Union level, you have, I think, mentioned the data retention directive. I think the pendulum is swinging in direction transparent citizen. So the protests we see and the opportunities that social media offer and also the loopholes for piracy that we have are actually maybe to be welcome to strike the balance. Now, being a civil servant, how will the role of the civil servant, the civil service, change? Uh, we did a report for the 2003 e-government conference in Cornwall in 2003, and there our main finding or our main message was um, e-government is the key to good governance. And it's not just about technology, but it's about a change of culture. And we're seeing that. We've heard all. I don't want to repeat what has been said before. But a key to good governance. And I think when we look at the issues that we will, we're dealing with, they are global issues. This is a call for more global and stronger global governance. That brings me to another point, or to the second point, the change in culture. In the public administrations, we have seen it. Uh, I have seen the changes, for example, in my country, in Austria. I remember when I left Austria, I was 10 years, um, almost 10 years in Brussels and then in Maastricht. And before I left in the mid-90s, I remember we had uh, an opportunity to send emails to our mission in Brussels. But they couldn't send us emails back because of security concerns. Yeah? I mean, everybody's laughing if I tell them the story, but it's not so long, long time ago, but at least for me, it's not so long time ago. So there has been massive changes, and we, d we, we take it for granted. Huh? But one thing in terms of the change, and I've heard it, and you've heard it in the Manchester Declaration, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. And it scares me a bit on the one hand, but also I'm an enthusiast of collaboration. It scares me because collaboration in the government context, in the context of our discussion, means um, that it will be difficult to identify who's accountable. Huh? That our systems, and in a way we look at jurisdiction, yeah? the concept do no longer work. 
So we need to make an effort here. But we definitely will have to have a set of rules uh, and agreed rules with how we get there. That's a different story. And I'm coming back to, let's say, the enthusiastic part of collaboration. And that's something um, I think we've heard a lot and we've understood. The key issue for the Tiger Leap in Estonia was looking into education and for having or exploiting or reaping the benefits of this collaboration effort, we need to create a culture of trust in many dimensions. And that starts with education. And it starts with people being able to live, if you will, a win-win approach. <coughs> and it starts with creating an enabling environment for the civil service. Because let's face it, it's not the person per se that doesn't want to collaborate. Yeah? It's the environment that doesn't enable the civil service. So I think there is a huge education effort required, but we're seeing budget cuts in the field of education. And the third thing is referred to what you were saying, which is a more sort of um, general observation. I had a chat uh, in a conference with uh, the founder of Flügel Television, you know, the um, Stutt Stuttgart 21 uh, um, mechanism and the, the story about Stuttgart 21, and he was uh, proposing a very interesting new model of representative democracy. This way, I understood it, and I thought maybe uh, we won't need uh, political parties anymore, and a citizen might just participate via social media, different channels of communication. But not all might want to actively participate, but they might want to find a trusted person, friend, who can act on their behalf. And it will be an issue-driven collaborative effort. But again, this needs informed citizens, and this needs informed uh, people. Uh, and again, it's a call for education again. And the role of the civil service, or the civil servant, in this process, the facilitator, the moderator, the mediator, but I don't think we will do without. We might just call him, her differently. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much, Christine. <laughs> Boje, please. Thank you. Uh, I will start with positioning myself to, toward this keynote speech, and uh, I am really not uh, sharing this idea. And I will give you an example. Let's imagine that uh, there is 100 penetration of internet in Greece and you ask uh, Greek people if they want to pay their debt or not. What do you expect from such a question? Which is absolutely technically possible to do. And uh, ask the same question to Germans. Do you want to pay Greek uh, debt or not? What do you expect from such a direct democracy? In both cases, well, the, the truth, economical truth is that not to pay Greek uh, debts by Greeks partially, Germans uh, partially on the other side is bad for both. But for that, we need knowledge. And we cannot equal people. Everybody in Switzerland can vote uh, for or against minarets. This is a simple question. Well, but it is not a simple question when we go to sophisticated today problems of contemporary societies. I am an engineer, so I cannot imagine that the construction of a bridge is done in such a way <coughs> that I send an email to everybody in the country asking if it should be, well, sick like that or thin like that. Well, and then I construct it following, you know, advices given by internet and so on. Who will enter this kind of bridge? Well, nobody. You have to give a power to engineers to make a right bridge. And it is a knowledge which is behind. Without this knowledge, you are unable to make a good bridge. The same with many cases concerning social life, economy, and, and agriculture, and everything which is in the society. So this vision that we do everything by voting is uh, very, how I, I would say, completely simplistic, nothing more. Hmm? Also, 
we are in Poland. I am from Poland. In Poland, we have a parliamentary election in 15 days. Well, so our parliament was dissolved these days. And there is a kind of a statistics, what they did during four years. They had 100 sessions of the parliament lasting for several days. And they voted something like, I do not know, several thousands of uh, laws, uh, well, novelization of laws and things like that. I, it was done by 460 people who are deputies in Poland. Well, I cannot imagine that uh, thousands of decisions during four years is made by 40 million people living in Poland. Well, even if it is technically possible. Well, but if people will be not engaged, because we'll be certainly not engaged, the next step for this direct democracy will be a law of making vote mandatory. Well, so every morning I wake up and I make decision concerning the whole nation. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, and going like that to 600. Well, and then I can go to work. This is completely unrealistic. <laughs> well, so uh, I, I want uh, not, not to focus on criticizing only. I want to say how, what is my <laughs> vision of the problem. Well, with uh, representative democracy. The key word is trust. Ideal democracy is like that. People are s selecting representative to whom they trust. They are the best of the best. We give them power and they act in the interest of the whole society. This is ideal vision of democracy. Now we are manipulated and we do not select uh, people who are uh, trust, uh, trusted by us, but the leader of a party. It is a colleague of a leader of a party or something like that. He's imposed and we even cannot present, especially in proportional system. Well, it is uh, vote by the leader of the party, not by people. People can only confirm or do not confirm what he did. Well, okay, so we have a political class which is which is not controllable, in the, which, is, which is not trustworthy. Well, I do not want to generalize, but it is the case in many countries. Well, okay. So we try to find an, a way by other means where we do not need trust and we can come to the same social interest. One such, uh, one such uh, say, attempt is direct democracy. If we cannot uh, trust our representative, take them off. Well, let's do it by ourselves. Well, it is his idea. Another keyword, <laughs> <laughs> what I understood at least. John, John, oh, okay, John, what I understood. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, second, uh, the second keyword is openness. Well, if uh, we do not trust our representative, let's control them to the 100 percent. In Poland we have a monitoring of uh, parliamentary deputies. It is a system uh, available on the internet for free for everybody who like. It is made by an NGO, so it is completely independent of politicians. And you can read everything about every deputy. How often he has been, uh, what he voted, how, what he proposed, what he asked, what he responded. Everything is available for everybody. The only problem is that nobody is interested in following this monitoring. So, uh, uh, coming back to the trust, well, the second uh, thing which is repeated many, many times in the governed community is openness. Well, but openness has price. This price is called privacy of people. Well, we cannot, if we do not limit openness to civil servants, but we want to extend it to the whole society, we sacrifice our we sacrifice our, our privacy, which means that somebody can manipulate us in a perfect way. In a, we are talking about futuristic uh, issues, so imagine that first, all your life is filmed. Mm -hmm. Because here are cameras, I am on a camera, well, here and so on. If I go to the airport, to the street and so on, okay. so all my life is uh, filmed. Second, somebody knows my genome, well, and uh, somebody knows all my friends and people with whom I communicate. I am a computer engineer. I can know with 99% all your decisions during your whole life in advance, better than you will know it. So there is a vision uh, how we can uh, misuse technology, which is, well, just approaching as close as possible. 
So we certainly need new democracy, but not direct. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Wojciech. I'm sure a response from Alexander is forthcoming. Yeah, sure. uh, in the meanwhile, <laughs> Sharon, can you please? I, I, I'm really sorry that I'm following Wojciech. <laughs> <laughs> my, my point of view is, is um, less uh, provocative, I think. Um, I, I find it very hard to imagine the future. I find it much easier to try to think about what are the forces that will shape the future. And in, in doing so, I, like Christine, I'm sort of reflecting back on my own career. And so I, I, there are three things that I'd like to mention. One, one is we look at our current state and we imagine the future from a point of view. Each of us has a point of view. And the second is that our point of view is embedded in some sort of context that is not the same as everyone else's context. And the third is that um, as human beings, we, we look for ways to simplify enormous complexity. And so we choose simplifications and generalizations that let us get through life. So let me just say a little bit about each one of those things. Um, my, my point of view comes from having spent a good portion of my career as a government manager. So I'm sort of an inside government point of view. And um, I've, I've spent many years both as a practitioner of government and as a student and scholar of government thinking about how do we make the apparatus of government, the people who work inside government, the professionals of government, um, more effective, better able to deliver the kinds of value that we expect our governments to deliver for us. And my point of view is beginning to change, especially over the last 10 years, really much more so even over the last five years, where I've been pushing myself to shed the inside government view and think more from a societal point of view and recognize the, the non-governmental actors or the sub state actors or the individuals who are all part of this enormous polity that, that we are um, engaged in. In terms of context, the, um, the, the kinds of things that Alexander talked about was a very dark view. I don't really like dark views, but I, I accept that that is a possible future because uh, of the, the kinds of trends that we see around us, both social trends and technical trends. Um, I, but, it, but the future scenario that you laid out was very much dependent on the political context of Europe. Um, this is not the political context everywhere in the world. And, um, and so for example, I think if, um, if in the United States, twice as many people who are, are currently politically active became active, we'd be, I would be very happy about that. If, Ten times as many people who are politically active today became politically active. I think that would be a good thing in our country. We, we have a lot of political apathy. And so the context is different. Um, and the third is this, this problem of, of generalizing in order to get through life. Um, and one of the big generalizations that um, I, I tend to have um, a knee-jerk reaction to is the, is the term citizen. Um, citizenship is a, a bundle of responsibilities and rights. Not everyone behaves as a citizen. Not everyone thinks of himself or herself as a citizen all the time, every day, or sometimes ever. Um, and, um, and so I was struck by one of, of the presentations in one of the paper sessions today um, where uh, the researchers were looking at tools to enable, to empower citizens to participate. One of the lines in the findings was, these tools can work for people who want to behave as citizens. And not, not everyone does. And so I, I think that um, the, these kinds of issues before us are, they're challenging. They may lead to very dark futures. They may not. I think they won't lead to the same future everywhere. And, um, and it's, it's up to us to be more thoughtful and judicious in how we interpret what we see around us, but also to be very vigilant in trying to understand the trends that, um, that are at work. And I, I, I think, Alexander, your point about understanding the confluence of trends that we have 
before this point thought about separately is a, is a really powerful and important notion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Oleg, your turn, on? please. You're on automatically. Okay, I hope it works. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm extremely pleased to be here in Estonia. It's my first visit. I've been working and collaborating with Estonian colleagues and friends for the last 10-12 uh, years. And finally, but I was looking for the right time to come here. Now this is the right time. And this is the right time to speak about the future. This very panel in Estonia, this is a country where we see the future now. And actually one of the wise people of this planet said that the future is here now. It's just not evenly distributed. So I think uh, by gathering here today and uh, discussing what works or doesn't work, best practices, you know, things which you're already doing, you're creating the future right now. Yeah? So we're actually creating the future by identifying what works, by spreading that through knowledge sharing, by you know, talking to each other, by helping each other, by collaborating on those uh, things which are already happening in countries like Estonia, US, Canada, Singapore, Korea, all the leaders of the government, and you can believe in anything. So in one area, you can be the future. You're doing something which is so super innovative. That would be 20 years from now everywhere. So we are, I would not be so pessimistic and say the future may be dark and you know, we don't have any control. We have the control of the future. In fact, uh, now we're creating it. So I would encourage you all to learn about what works from each other, and we're already doing this this conference, and try to scale it up by sh uh, you know, replicating the good practices, sharing, collaborating. I come from the World Bank. World Bank, we see us as a knowledge platform, as a financing platform. So we are in a good position to share that knowledge. So we'd like, if you have knowledge, what works from various uh, countries, various organizations, please come to us share that knowledge. We'll be very happy to make it a global knowledge, to make it very visible. So this way we accelerate the future, because uh, that, uh, what is uh, happening in your country may become you know, mainstream you know, 10, 20 years from now. This will be the, the future, right? So I would strongly encourage you to come to us and share your knowledge, because we have this uh, open developing knowledge platform. This whole openness topic is won the, you know, the day. You know, it's uh, won the minds of World Bank hardcore economists even. So our president, Mr. Zolik, is fully on board with this open uh, development, open government, open data agenda. So we get this top leadership at the banks. We stream, mainstream it for our country operations, for the knowledge uh, work, for all the other aspects. So we're really open for business in this open uh, world, open development, open government. Uh, and I am here with the mandate, actually, invite you to join our knowledge platform on open development, open government, which we're developing now. And we hope to partner very closely with the Open Government Initiative, which was launched last week uh, at the UN General Assembly. In fact, we, we see our role as a as implementation partner, as a knowledge partner for the, this open government partnership. I think this is probably the best thing which happened recently in the government world to make the future a bit faster, closer. So I think uh, if uh, open government partnership works, it, we, it will really have a huge impact on how fast we'll see the innovations which are happening now in the US. I, I live in Washington DC, so I, I can see the future now, what, what is happening in many cities and many agencies. I think, uh, and it, I do not say US is the most innovative country, because you have Singapore, Korea, so well, Estonia. So, and I, I'd love to, you know, really um, uh, be more active and effective, helpful to you to uh, you know, spread your innovation, spread your best practices to, to accelerate this future. And the future, I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to be murky and fuzzy, you know? We know where it will be. We know it will be mobile. We know that today everybody is starting to use mobile. So whatever innovations are there uh, using mobile delivery, you know, this is the future. So let's help each other to use the mobile platform better. You know, this is a, government will be mobile, it's obvious. Uh, future will be uh, open, right? As we said, we heard today, uh, we heard yesterday from Chris and others, you know, everything is being opened up. This is a big trend. So we have highly participatory government, we have uh, social media being extremely important as uh, the delivery vehicle for governments. We have uh, a PPP, public private partnership, as a way to deliver services, not the traditional way of when government is in charge and doing everything themselves. So this, uh, this uh, openness, participatory uh, trend in government, I think will be huge. And I think government does have to be monopolist of uh, public service. Even public service term has to be re re redefined. Because we thought that public service things which are delivered by the government, by public sector. But many of the services are increasingly being delivered by civil society, by, you know, by private sector. So I think we are just scratching the surface what is possible. 
And the thing will be uh, completely different 10, 20 years from now. And we can see already uh, all of these elements in some of the countries which are representing, representing here. And Estonia is one of them. I congratulate Estonia for great success story. It's uh, one of the uh, best examples of ins inspirational leadership, which has huge impact on the CIS region. And I travel a lot in the CIS, and I see how you know, experience your uh, example. It's really inspiring. A lot of change transformation. And I see a lot of new countries emerging as leaders. Georgia is uh, implementing very interesting innovations. Moldova I was uh, very you know, happy to you know, work with Moldova the last 12 months. We have a very transformational project uh, in Moldova, which is in the spirit of open government, the first country to launch open data in this uh, sub-region. Uh, I'm CIS, uh, and we, World Bank is financing that project. Uh, we work very closely with uh, Yuri and, and his team. So we hope to have more such projects, uh, which are very transformational, open in nature, uh, using our financing platform uh, uh, vehicle. Uh, so I'd like to again encourage all of you to partner with us. Uh, we will be happy to help you in any way possible. If you need financing, you know, let's talk. If you need uh, us to help you share your knowledge, or learn from best practices, we have different tools for that. And again, I'd like us to be empowered and feel that we control the future. It's not something you know, which will happen to us. Okay? So we are creating the future right now, right? discussing what works. We are determining what will happen worldwide in the next uh, five, ten years. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very um, optimistic view. Alexander, it's your time to uh, offer uh, a response. Yes, okay. I have, I have um, four points uh, for Wojciech. <laughs> <laughs> First, um, I profoundly disagree with you uh, on your assessment that all you need is knowledge and then things work. Uh, because then we can do away with parliaments and parties and representatives right now. Do you think that every uh, decider in Parliament has full knowledge about the, about the laws he's, uh, he's deciding? Certainly not. Um, so we have the same problem there concerning knowledge in representative democracies as we have it in direct democracy. Uh, by the way, um, I would use, uh, like to use a metaphor that is used a lot in political science when we describe competency of, of the publics to decide about difficult uh, uh, points or, or complex issues. I doubt that even an engineer would know exactly how his car works uh, in order to be oh, able to drive it. You don't need to do, to do that. You can drive a car very safely um, if you know how to drive without knowing how the engine works. Second point, um, I agree with you. Di excessive di uh, direct democracy is, is, is terrible. It's very bad. It was my, it was one of my points, but <laughs> No direct democracy is not possible anymore. Okay? It doesn't happen anymore. It, it is everywhere. And I would argue that if well institutionalized, within, uh, you know, with the necessary safeguards, well, then it is functioning and it's even uh, normatively desirable, I would say. Third point, control of MPs, and nobody is interested in controlling Polish MPs, um, Yes, but precisely because these systems are not integrative parts of a bigger, uh, of a bigger uh, uh, platform, for example, where these tools are linked to each other. Um, and finally, the, the last point is uh, that I also uh, would like to say that uh, quite a few bridges and, and roads and train stations are built and create quite a few problems precisely because uh, citizens were not involved in it. At least that's what uh, your, your contact at, in Stuttgart would, would, would certainly um, say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can, drive, uh, <laughs> you can drive a car without knowing uh, how it works, but you cannot construct a uh, car without knowing how to do it. So parliamentary people are not, uh, parliamentary people are not to drive a car. Parliamentary people are to construct a legal system that manage the whole society. Well, so uh, I absolutely disagree that the direct democracy can solve this kind of problem. <coughs> also, if you, if you are looking on how many people in, uh, in Europe, at least, well, are not going to vote even if they have full right, and it is not so big deal to go to, well, sometimes few, few meters and just push uh, it into 
so you, you see how people, people do not want to wake up. Uh, you are fascinating by politics, maybe I am uh, partially too, but I do not want to spend my time on, uh, you know, if somebody comes to me with some, I don't know, agricultural culture, I know nothing about it, or fishery or something like that, this is not my job to make a decision about that. Well, I do not want to do it. Well, I want to find a right representative which will act in my... Um, on my behalf, well, mm, sure, and I have to trust right. it, and that's it. But that's your well, right. So, so uh, also, I am, I am not fascinating by controlling my deputy from my city, well, uh, every day, what he did, how he did, and so on. I can watch my kids, but I do not want to, <laughs> the same way, follow my deputy. Well, it is... So, I say it, it is perfectly possible with internet and with all these things to do such things, well, but it will be never accepted socially. So it is why I find it uh, unrealistic. I, I think it will not happen simply because people will not accept it and not because it is not possible technically. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's open the uh, floor for discussion. We have uh, 10 minutes left. Please. Well, I'd maybe comment on the bridge and direct democracy. The way I see it is I would never really ask citizens how to, bridge, uh, how to build the bridge, but I might want to ask them where to put it. So I think instead of trying to think about whether direct democracy will be here or not because it will be here, we should start thinking about what types of problems can be better resolved to direct democracy than through the current mechanisms that we have because that's the way we are obviously heading. Absolutely, it's local problems. If you have a problem like, uh, do you want to have a school here or a hospital? Then you can ask citizens what they prefer. If there is a lot of uh, parents of young children, they will vote for school. If there is a lot of elderly, they will vote for hosp hospital. Even without asking them, we know the answer. Well, okay, so the role of, poli the yeah. the role of politicians you should the run role, for parliament. The, yeah, <laughs> the, the role of politicians Clearly. is to find the right compromise that all the parts of the society are covered by right decisions and not just those who has a temporary majority on vote. Well, Yuri? Yeah, thank you. Oh, well, coming back to, to a bridge, I think that sets a good metaphor also that in Russia there was a bridge built over the river Volga and then it was crumbling and, and sort of <laughs> uh, swimming. So I think that in that case possibly it would be a good idea to ask citizens. Iman, citizens are very good engineers as well and c engineers are also citizens and citizens are engineers. But my, that's not my point. My point is that I haven't really sort of... Uh, I perceived Alexander's presentation as a very murky kind of outlook of, of the future and uh, I don't think that he really sort of uh, pushing this direct democracy uh, agenda. And what I like in his presentation actually is that he started with Schumpeter and <laughs> ended with Schumpeter and I think what a governance actually at least the known practice of a governance has demonstrated that the Schumpeterian kind of view of a citizen as an ignorant and stampede voter has been completely demolished. So citizens is not stupid, and we know that. I think this is thanks to many initiatives that have been doing. Of course, there's a problem on the part of uh, sort of involving citizens into to the governance issues, and Christine referred to many, many issues that civil servants and others facing in, in, in this respect. But uh, the, this dispersed knowledge which Chris Vane referred in his presentation, that's a challenge, how to capture and how to bring that, of course, in the future, the civil s service and government in general and state have to change. That's no doubt under the citizens' pressure. Uh, it's clear, but uh, uh, citizens have to be responsible as well in that respect, and there's a, lot, a long way in order to bridge those issues where you have the empowered civil society empowered by technology and the government of course reacting uh, sometimes wisely, some, some countries like Estonia, some countries not. But uh, what I would like to really see in the future is that what Chan mentioned, that, that uh, uh, there should be more politics and, and citizens should be more involved in politics. And I remember a wonderful publication written in '62 by Bernard Crick in defense of politics, of course, on a different issue, but I think it's still valid that uh, we should not be afraid of politicizing citizens. They are not so stupid. 
to destroy everything. I think if they would be acting, they would be acting definitely in defense of democracy. Thank you. Any Bravo. response? <laughs> Okay. Salim, please. Uh, yeah, I would like to make a comment about e-voting and then uh, address the concept of future, what is going to be the future, especially in e-governance. Uh, e-voting, e one of the disadvantages is you are losing the secret ballot, you are losing confidentiality. And therefore, imagine in the future at some time you don't need to cast your ballot because citizens, when they go in, it's recorded, there is something called artificial intelligence that can monitor several programs can be running in the background so eventually uh, a political profile of each citizen of each member of the society is being built up uh, and imagine the candidate would log in and he would see like uh, like uh, like an, uh, you know a meter saying how much he's popular how much he's not so you don't need a that's of course that's future science fiction if you want to call it but Starting from this, let me address the second point where I think the future is going to be what's the critical factor in future in e-governance. I would use one word only. Technology is going fine. There will be lots of magical things coming, so innovation will be working. We cannot, you know, we cannot... It's a Pandora's box. Technology is out of the box. So definitely, technical people can, uh, can have dreams, and those dreams can easily materialize. But the future is the word impact, the impact of e-governance, impact where the, 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 the policymakers, the, the, the governments, when they use e-governance and e-government applications, what impact that would reside on the behavior of the citizen, behavior of the government, the decision maker, and therefore con contextually all the society, considering that democracy and dictatorship is two sides of the same coin. It's a spectrum, so it's not like exactly. black and white. Mm -hmm. I, can give I, can, I can give citations where the most democratic country, there, are, there is some dictatorship, and on the other way, on the other side, there is a dictatorship, autocratic rule, a country that at least the people feel somehow relaxed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Boyga, <laughs> please. Um, <clears throat> what um, I... I have, I have a question to Alexander. One of the things um, I see clearly from your presentation, which again is consistent with some of the messages we have been listening to in this conference, is that you, you claim that there has to be a limit, you know, to to everything, proved in very sim uh, simplistic. Um, we listened, for example, to talks on the Open Data Initiative, and, we, and the lesson there was, also an issue there was, to what extent can government be transparent? And your argument here, fundamentally, the way I see your own talk, is that you're saying that, look, can't take this to the extreme. Um, but, mm -hmm. so, we see mm -hmm. um, uh, an ongoing boundary or threshold dilemma. And the question is, how do you resolve this dilemma? Who, I mean, who, which of the actors, government or citizens, will be in a position to, um, to negotiate the, this boundary? So I feel this is a consistent issue um, um, when you look at the future. I mean, we, things can't just go for that. It's common, it's a simple fact and common sense. Um, but the issue is, how do you negotiate the boundaries? Okay. Thank you very much. Any more questions, comments? Yes, please. Um, thank you. The, the question is about, is there a role for the post, postal service in e-government? Is there still a role? Postal services. Postal service. Any of the panelists would like to address a question of the role of postal services in e-government? Electronic. And they can uh, make a vote and ask. Uh, it is like uh, the problem is not in voting. The problem is uh, what is the impact? What is the power of voting? Well, so if the decision made by voting it is adversary, all politicians are making uh, by voting to some extent. Well, are collecting opinion and to know if they go in the right direction, acceptable direction, and unacceptable direction by the society, which part of the society, and so on and so on. It is also a kind of voting. Well, so the problem is not in voting, the problem is uh, who has power, well, representatives or direct uh, citizens. This is a question. Okay. I, I, okay. Taking, uh, I, I also like to, to respond to, to one question. 
It is not true that e-voting is not, uh, we lose secret ballot. We have algorithms uh, developed in IT which permits perfectly to secretly vote, but check by each citizen if his vote was counted in a proper way. The problem is again with trust, because uh, if we have uh, paper voting, the opposite party, in any case, can say, I want to check if uh, calculations were right. Well, so you can always open, uh, open and, and cal calculate again. Well, if you, have, uh, if you have electronic voting, only engineers are able to check if it was correct or not. Well, so every opposition party, which usually is not run by engineers, can say, I do not believe that it was correctly counted. Well, so... Uh, that is the main uh, reason why electronic voting is not implemented, okay? It is because uh, it, it needs a trust in, in, uh, in the society. So politicians say it is better not to have, to have a heavy procedure of paper voting but avoid these mistrust uh, problems than to go to easy voting via internet but to have this kind of, uh, of uh, trust problem. Okay. Alexander, you have a response very, to... Very briefly, to the gentleman uh, asking about the limits, I think you, you perfectly grasped the, the, the idea I was trying to, to, to basically bring, bring across here, uh, is that excessive things, including excessive direct democracy, excesses of transparency can hurt democracy. Uh, it's not always good to have full transparency of everything. Uh, there are, there are good, good publications about that, actually. Um, but how to, where exactly to put these limits of how far we can go <laughs> is a political question that I would not want to ask engineers to answer, for example. <laughs> but uh, maybe society itself, uh, which, which, you know, most of the cases has quite well limited its own rights to not go beyond, say, um, fundamental rights violation. And when it does it, then you have mechanisms such as courts, judges, etc., which can correct that. Um, I mentioned a Swiss excess from my point of view and a fundamental rights violation through direct democracy, and I'm utterly unhappy with this, and that's because the political mechanisms have not worked that would have prevented this to happen, but they existed. And uh, we now still have the judges in Strasbourg to maybe come back to that. But Okay, uh, last question, please. Uh, the discussion is so far focusing on having a static governance model. I would think in the future empowering those uh, civil society will impact the whole governance model. That means civil society will not only, their role is not to push government to do things better, but they, it might be to organize the society to take care of different issues, and then we will have a shift maybe, the, the government will, ha will have less government but then the society will take care of different issues in the future. So we shouldn't only focus on voting issue and the democratic process because in five, ten years from now, I don't think that we will have a similar model. It's either it will be different and the power will be shifted, but to or organize civil society, not to uh, push the government to do things better, but for the society to do most of the things better. Mm. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, any response? Uh, if not, maybe, yes, maybe please. Just, just yes. very briefly, I fully agree with you. And in that sense, uh, when we talk about participation, we always talk about you know the rights. We hardly ever talk about the responsibilities, you know. Mm -hmm. And you probably would have a model of like governance by care for civil society or for the common good or for public value. I fully agree with you in that point. Okay. Uh, we run out of time. Uh, please join me in thanking our distinguished panel for. <laughs> A, a fascinating discussion and we will we will make sure to invite them a year from now to see which future will will materialize thank you very much i understand the closing session is continuing immediately after this session without break okay, okay. thank you again thank you.